Today's webinar is titled Applied Structural Geology of Ore Forming Hydrothermal Systems, a summary of discussion of the contents of SEG Review Volumes 21. I will be uh, moderating today's webinar along with Duncan Proctor, who is the SEG strategist for education and training with SEG, and I'm the community relations manager with SEG. Our two Volume editors will be um, hosting the event. Julie Rowland, or JR, uh, got hooked on structural geology when she returned to academia after a decade of teaching physical education. She took a bachelor's project with Bernard Soprelli, who taught her the value of detailed observation. And then she had a doctorate under the mentorship of Professor Rick Sibson, who emphasized the need to sort the signal from the noise. From both, she learned the value of inspirational teaching. Since then, she has worked on structural controls of high fluid flow with applications to volcanic tectonic hazards and mineral and geothermal exploration. JR's current research passion is orogenic scale control on metal transfer from source to sink. She is a Skinner awardee and the former regional vice president of Australasia, Australasia for the Society of Economic Geologists. She is the head of the School of for, School of Environment at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Dave, uh, the second volume editor, is a consulting geologist based in Vancouver, Canada. He has worked for more than 25 years in the mining industry, applying geological studies with a structural focus to exploration, development, and mining. Dave has extensive experience in the gold deposits, having worked globally on numerous gold districts of various types for a variety of clients, including both major and junior companies. His focus is on advanced project and active mining operations, aiding in the interpretation of mine site or controls, application of mine geology to local and district scale exploration activities and training of geological teams. Dave. Thank you very much, Deanne. And thank you, Duncan, uh, for uh, helping organize this webinar. Uh, the, the webinar is based, of course, on the SDG Reviews Volume 21, which was published uh, just over a year and a half ago. And this volume was conceived to help fill a gap in applied structural geology, um, since um, there's a lot of theory, there's a lot of work being done in other industries, uh, in, in oil exploration, uh, which, which hasn't necessarily been brought necessarily into the realm of, of of typical use in uh, mineral exploration and mining. And also too, it's been 20 years since there was a, a similar publication uh, in SEG Reveals Volume 14. So the intent was to span theory and practice across mineral deposit types at various different scales. And we've assembled a, a series of papers that initially cover applications of principles of structural geology to ore deposits and the processes that drive and concentrate uh, metals into forming rocks, of which you'll hear some of the, these talks today. The subsequent papers review contrasting structural contexts and illustrated by different deposit types that have uh, varying styles of structural uh, controls, behavior, influence of host rock rheology, proximity to magmatic sources, and also post-mineral deformation. And then we round out the volume with a series of papers that uh, document workflow and practice and interpretation, modeling, and use of structural data and field relationships. So we hope that you'll find that this volume is a, uh, a practical and uh, a good summary of, of all these different aspects, which provides a, a good base for everyone from students to, uh, to uh, uh, industry people and researchers hoping to uh, uh, either refer to or brush up on their structural aspects. So we'll go to the next slide, Deanne, please. So here's our agenda for today. We're starting off, of course, with the introduction right now, and we're gonna dive into the talks and the sequence that really um, uh, goes through uh, the same uh, set of papers as in the volume. We have representatives of all of the major papers in the volume uh, speaking today. And so uh, we'll start off uh, with Tom Blankensop and uh, uh, JR, I guess it's uh, you will be introducing Tom. Yeah, kia ora koutou, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm just delighted to see so many people on the webinar today. I hope you really enjoy it. Uh, I've had a sneak preview of some of these talks and I, and I think it's going to be a really terrific webinar today. And starting us off, of course, is Tom Blinkensop, 
And Tom is a professor at the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences in Cardiff University, and he applies structural geology to the study of natural resources. His research focuses on faulting and fluid flow and structural controls on mineralization at all scales. And Tom works extensively with the exploration and mining industry, mainly on copper, gold, and iron oxide copper gold deposits. Tom graduated from Oxford University and completed an MSc degree at Imperial College before undertaking his doctorate at Keele University and postdoctoral research at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He was a professor at the University of Zimbabwe and then at James Cook University of Australia, which is where I think I first met you, Tom, and you were a director of the Economic Geology Research Unit there. Uh, Tom's published over 150 papers, a textbook, and an online course in structural geology for exploration and mining. And I can say from personal experience that Tom is fantastic to go into the field with, because I recall, Tom, we had a brilliant time uh, in the Outer Hebrides looking at pseudotacolites once. Um, so I hope you really enjoy this talk by Tom. He kicked the volume off, and it's a, a great introduction to uh, the fundamentals of structure and tectonics in relation to mineral deposits. Tom. Hello, everybody from Cardiff. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors listed here on this first slide. In this talk, I want to discuss applications of structural geology to hydrothermal gold mineralization, making three important points. Firstly, that the geometry of deformation zone networks is important. Secondly, looking at the mechanics of deformation zones. And thirdly, very much more speculatively, something about mechanical regimes of hydrothermal gold mineralization. The examples on the screen before you are examples of individual structural features which control gold mineralization, ranging from extensional veins, such as this one here from Sunrise Dam, to breccias, also in Sunrise Dam, at the discontinuous end of the spectrum, through to shear zone hosted gold deposits, such as Tropicana gold mine here and Cornishman, also in Western Australia. Now, those are individual deformation zones. And what I want to concentrate on in the next part of the talk is the way that these individual deformation zones, which themselves are composed of isolate, uh, single or more examples of structures such as fractures, veins, and steinites, the way these zones themselves, at a larger scale, come together to create networks such as stockworks or fault fracture net meshes. And in particular, concentrating on the way that faults come to create fault zone networks and the equivalence in, in continuous deformation of shear zone networks. Starting with faults, when we think about sets of faults, we often think about a conjugate arrangement of faults about the principal stresses, such as shown here. But for a long while now, another line of approach has been to look at faults in relation to the principal stretches or strains. And this sort of approach has yielded the insight that very often faults don't simply form two orientations which can be regarded as conjugate, but in a single deformation, they may form four or even more sets of faults in different orientations. And this is called polymodal faulting. And the key thing about these faults is that they are arranged symmetrically around the principal stretches rather than the stresses. In the paper by Healy and others, the case is made that in fact, when looking more closely at examples which were previously considered as conjugate faults, uh, the more detailed analysis of their orientations reveals that there may in fact be multiple fault sets. And there's a very good mechanical reason for that. It is that in, it's only in this sort of arrangement that truly triaxial strains can be accommodated, whereas the conjugate fault set 
only allows plain strain. Now, putting that in a slightly broader context, we can also see that the arrangement of faults depends on the bulk strain type. This is, for example, an arrangement of polymodal faults that would occur in a constrictional strain contrasted with the flattening strain shown down here below. And the same is true in the domain of continuous deformation for shear zones. For example, in constrictional strains, shear zones tend to form networks which isolate lithons or unstrained bodies of rock, which are prolate in shape. In flattening strain, those lithons tend to be oblate in strain shape. Now, early examples of the application of this sort of approach. Um, one particular notable example of that was the work by Benoit Dubé and others, in which they identified a variety of mineralized structures which were arranged symmetrically about the bulk strains in the Norbo mine, Quebec. Other early examples of that have been demonstrated by Francois de Robert. But much more recently, after uh, discussing with Dave Rees, some of his work on epithermal deposits, it looks very likely that these very interesting maps of mineralized structures from a number of different epithermal deposits could reveal an underlying polymodal pattern of faults. Dave has been quick to point out that it's very difficult to establish this because timing relationships are often very difficult to know for individual faults in such networks. And really for a polymodal fault network, one wants to establish that essentially the faults formed all at a more or less uh, simultaneous deformation event. Nevertheless, the idea has great potential and it's something we're not necessarily often aware of. I want to move on now to another aspect of fault networks. This is the way in which we can analyze fault networks from a topological point of view. This sort of work has derived mainly from work in the hydrocarbon industry, but it's ripe for application now in hydrothermal mineralization. So the idea here is that a network of fractures can be divided up into so-called branches by identifying nodes where fractures cross each other or join each other or where they terminate. And that, in fact, gives rise to a threefold classification of nodes between I nodes, where fractures end, these red circles here, Y nodes, where one fracture joins another, the green triangles here, and X nodes, where two fractures cross each other. And by simply counting the number of these respective types of nodes, we can gain tremendous insights into the connectivity of this sort of fracture network. Here's an example, in fact, of a fracture network which does consist of gold bearing faults. Um, they're labeled up according to the I, Y, and X scheme here. And the, one of the first things we can do with a simple count of the number of nodes within the circular scanning area is to calculate the connectivity, which is essentially the ratio between. Uh, the Y and the X nodes and the total number of nodes. Obviously, a network consisting only of I nodes would be very disconnected, whereas a completely crossing network consisting only of, of Y and X nodes would be completely connected. Once we've done that count and calculated the connectivity, we can plot it on a diagram like this, which has the I nodes at the top apex of the triangle, the Y and the X nodes along the bottom, this particular fault network plots up here, close to the I apex of the triangle, and therefore relatively unconnected. And you can see on the diagram the contours of the connectivity. So in fact, this network has a connectivity of just about one. At the base of the triangle between the Y and the X apices, we've got the maximum conductivity of two. But it's not just the uh, connectivity that we need to worry about. It's also the intensity. Clearly, we could have uh, a network which is completely connected, but consisted only, of, for example, of one X node. So to calculate the intensity of branches, we need a different measure, 
and that is easily obtained with a circular scan line simply by counting the number of fractures which intersect the scan line, the so-called edge nodes, and the formula for calculating the intensity is the number of those edge nodes divided by four times the radius. So now let's take those ideas and apply them to a gold deposit. I want to take you to the Sunrise Dam gold mine in the eastern part of the Ilgarn Craton in the Laverton Greenstone Belt. In many ways, a very typical Archean node gold deposit. The open pit is shown here at the top of this diagram and the numerous underground nodes currently being exploited in a bewildering variety of different orientations, reflecting the very complex deformation history. That's uh, all incidental, really. I just want to show you a development drive here in the Astro node, which is on this slide here. And you can see that there are indeed a network of fractures which are mutually cross-cutting each other. They formed simultaneously and um, all potentially auriferous. These are quartz carbonate veins. And this is an ideal situation in which to apply a network type of analysis, which we can do here by taking our circular scan line and moving it and at intervals counting the nodes in the usual way. The result of that exercise is that we can show the connectivity on this vertical axis of the graph here against the intensity and bearing out, bearing out what I just said about the necessity for measuring these two quantities independently. There's no relationship between them. Now, this idea has been taken a stage further by Francois Turlin's work, in which he looked at the connectivity of uh, fractures down a borehole and plotting this graph showing that connectivity value, there is some interesting relationship between the gold grade, which is shown in the gray shading behind the connectivity plot. So this is uh, something which has got great promise as a future direction for network analysis in hydrothermal mineral deposits. And now I want to move on to the mechanics and I'm going to make quite considerable use in the next few slides of failure mode diagrams. Here's a nice, a nice exposition of failure mode diagrams from Steve Cox's work. In these diagrams, we're plotting the pore fluid factor, that is the ratio between the pore fluid and the vertical stress on the vertical axis against the differential stress on the horizontal axis. And the great thing about these diagrams is that they allow us to um, conceptually evaluate the effect of increasing the differential stress moving horizontally compared to move, increasing the pore fluid pressure moving vertically or some combination of those two different paths to failure. And uh, equally, in, Usefully, we can divide up the regimes along the failure line between extensional, hybrid extensional shear failure and shear failure. Now, one of the drawbacks of this sort of diagram is that it does not include the influence of the intermediate principal stress. And this has been realized as important for many, many years now. And Recently, there's been quite a lot of experimental work confirming the fact that the failure, failure criteria do depend on the intermediate principal stress. One of the earliest suggestions of this is the Griffith Murrell failure criterion, which is a really quite simple expression here. And we can introduce uh, into the failure criterion the intermediate principal stress via the stress ratio phi, sigma 2 minus sigma 3 over sigma 1 minus sigma 3. And doing that allows us to write an equation like this, which we can plot on a failure mode diagram. And it looks like this. First of all, it's interesting to note that the failure lines are curved. And secondly, we can note that there is quite a spread of differential stress versus pore fluid pressure, depending on the phi value from zero, where sigma two is equal to sigma three, to one, where sigma two is equal to sigma one. These diagrams are arranged so that compressional or reverse stress states with sigma one horizontal, sigma three vertical are on the left, and on, uh, on the right, and on the left, 
or normal stress states with sigma one vertical. And you'll notice that the, the curves are different according to those different tectonic regimes. And they're also different according to the depth for which they've been plotted. Now, the exact position of those curves in poor fluid factor versus differential stress space is probably less important than the concept that in addition to increasing de differential stress and increasing poor fluid pressure, there is another path to failure. That is decreasing the value of the stress ratio phi. And these three ways in which we can affect failure can probably interact in ways which could be quite complicated and eventually quite non-linear. So this is uh, a new approach really to looking at failure in hydrothermal systems, which does include the well-known effect of the intermediate principal stress. Now, finally, and much more speculatively, I want to show on a type of failure mode diagram, potentially the regimes or mechanical regimes where different types of gold deposit might plot. In this particular sort of failure mode diagram, we're plotting poor fluid pressure rather than poor fluid factor, but we still got differential stress on the horizontal axis. Again, determined, differentiated between reverse stress fields and normal stress fields. And at the bottom of the diagram, we can start by looking at volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, which plot, of course, um, very uh, low in the diagram in terms of poor fluid pressures because they form at the surface. Interestingly enough, Carlin type deposits occupy a quite distinctive field because they're only known from normal stress environments, whereas epithermal deposits are known from both normal and reverse stress environments and cover, therefore, a much wider field in this sort of diagram. Intrusion-related gold deposits and porphyry deposits are very similar in the space that they occupy, going up to uh, sort of intermediate values of poor fluid pressure. While IOCG may also occupy that, those sorts of poor fluid pressures, but extend to much wider range of differential stresses. And then finally, in the background, with the largest field of all, in the diagram are the low gold deposits, which may of course go up to very high pore fluid pressures and potentially to large differential stresses. Although Steve Cox makes the point that in fact probably many low gold deposits are rather uh, formed at rather low differential stresses. And if this diagram is to have uh, some use, more use in the future, I think uh, one nice thing to do would be to try and refine the um, more precisely the fields which different styles of gold mineralization fall in this diagram. But it's the first attempt anyway to identify mechanical regimes with different types of gold mineralization. So that brings me to the conclusions and just to remind you that we started off by looking at the relationship between networks of deformation zones and their predictable relationships with bulk strain. The idea of topology has been a useful property of networks to analyze. The inclusion of the intermediate principal stress in um, failure mode diagrams. And lastly, the more speculative idea that there are particular mechanical regimes or uh, um, which can characterize some types of gold deposits. And those <clears throat> really, in the end, are just reflections of the different tectonic environments and stress and fluid pressure conditions in the crust. But it's perhaps a nice way of summarizing those factors and their influence on hydrothermal gold mineralization. Thank you very much. Dave, you're on mute. Mute. Sorry, there we go. Uh, so thank you very much, Tom, for that uh, thought-provoking talk, which really combines two of the uh, the papers from the volume that Tom was lead author for.
So our, our next uh, speaker up here is Stephen Cox. Stephen is a professor of structural geology or is now retired professor of structural geology at the uh, Research School of Earth Sciences at Australian National University. His research interests are primarily in the coupling between deformation processes and fluid flow and crustal regimes with applications to ore genesis and earthquake mechanics. His research is pursued via field-based studies, microstructural, microchemical, and stable isotope analyses, high pressure, high temperature rock deformation experiments, and numerical modeling. Stephen holds a BSc <clears throat> excuse me, a degree from the University of Tasmania and a PhD degree from the Monash University. And, and Stephen was the dis SEG Distinguished Lecturer in 2007. So please, uh, let's uh, um, have a look at Stephen's presentation. Hello, everybody. What I want to do over the next few minutes is just outline the key points in my paper in the reviews volume on the dynamics and permeability enhancement in fluid flow in overpressure fracture controlled hydrothermal systems. As such, the paper examines the controls on the formation and location of fluid pathways and various aspects of the dynamics of flow, particularly in overpressure fault and fracture controlled hydrothermal systems. The paper deals mainly with the seismogenic crustal settings, that is depths between several kilometres to approximately 15 or 20 kilometres. It doesn't deal particularly with the deeper, more ductile or viscous flow regimes. What I've got to say is relevant, especially to orogenic gold systems and magmatic hydrothermal systems, but also some parts of epithermal systems and some types of IOCG deposits. There are four main highlights I want to address. The first is that permeability is a very dynamic parameter in actively deforming rocks, so it changes dramatically over many orders of magnitude. The second point is that fluid pressurisation is the main driver of fracture formation and permeability enhancement in these overpressured systems. Thirdly, there are major structural controls on where the greatest permeability enhancement occurs in individual faults. And finally, I want to emphasise that flow of overpressured fluids in low permeability rocks generates not main shock aftershock type seismic behaviour, but a distinctive type of swarm seismicity, uh, which we call injection driven swarm seismicity. Let's highlight firstly dynamics of permeability. In reactive hydrothermal systems, in low permeability host rocks, we need to generate firstly new permeability, and this is done predominantly by fracturing, but also influenced by uh, fluid rock reactions and permeability enhancement, uh, pore creation during reactions. The second point is that fracture permeability and pore permeability is very short lived in high temperature hydrothermal systems. They are very quickly sealed. So, the sustained large fluid fluxes that are required to generate large ore deposits require repeated regeneration of permeability by repeated regeneration of new fractures or reactivation of existing ones. In seismic settings, permeability typically has large spatial and temporal fluctuations and is linked to the seismic cycle. Permanently evolution is governed by dynamic competition between fracture generation associated with slip events and fracture sealing between slip events. So as we see in the diagram over here down the bottom, permanently in log scale is dramatically dropping between seismic events and seismic events drive it up and see this cyclic turning on and off of the valve, what Rick Simpson calls fault valve behaviour. The diagram above shows a flat thrust in the gold system in Western Australia. And we can see there's a lot of evidence for cyclicity in here, episodic slip and permanently enhancement associated with fault dilation and vein generation. So episodic flow and large fluctuations in flow rate and fluid pressure are typical in seismogenic regimes. Brittle failure and permeability enhancement. The key point is that in overpressed systems, failure and associated permeability enhancement is driven largely by fluid pressurisation. On the right here is a failure mode diagram which plots differential stress sigma 1 minus sigma 3 on the horizontal axis and pore fluid factor, that is the ratio of uh, pore fluid pressure to vertical stress here. So this is lithostatic here. This is the failure envelope for a typical rock. Red generates extension fractures, blue is shear failure or fault slip and green is hybrid extensional shear failure. Normally away from fluid systems, 
loading of rocks or increasing differential stress or shear stress drives us horizontally across to the failure state. So here we get shear failure. But in overpressured hydrothermal systems, fluid injection into the rock mass is fast relative to tectonic loading and we can be driven vertically towards failure on a path like this. This one would generate extension failure. This one at high differential stress would generate shear failure. So fluid pressurisation is critical in driving failure, not tectonic loading. The stress regime is critical, however, in controlling both the orientation of activated faults and fractures and the failure modes. That is, whether we have extension fractures, a mixture of extension fractures and shear failures, dilation in faults, or in this case, ductile shear. So deposit style is very much controlled by differential stress. What we see is that at low differential stress over here, failure is dominated by extension fracture systems such as porphyry copper type systems, whereas at somewhat higher differential stress, but still fairly low, we can get shear failure in here. This boundary is typically about 40 or 50 megapascals. There's major structural controls on the location and geometry of high fluid flux sites within individual faults. These relate to where high bimodality, that is high fracture density, high dilation sites develop within faults. High dilation occurs typically in step overs. These can be jogs, which are oriented as pipe-like structures perpendicular to the slip vector. They can be both dilational and contractional. There are fault relays where the step over structure is parallel to the slip vector. So here's a relay, here's a jog here. Uh, fault bends are also important, fault termination zones where ruptures end, and fault branches and intersections are also critical. And they're highlighted in this diagram over here, which illustrates complex pathways using a mixture of relays, jogs, another jog, a branch line between two faults, then there may be a fluid outlet up there. But the important point is, and this is critical in exploration, is that not all high permeability sites are prospective. They must connect hydraulically with the fluid source, which may be an underlying magmatic body, or it may be a deep uh, metamorphic devalatalization source, or even a deeper still subducting slab. So there's a need to reduce exploration risk by recognition of what are the signals which occur around pathways, such as alteration styles and vein development that can occur sometimes hundreds of metres away from faults. We need to also recognise that the interplay of slip directions and geometry controls the geometry of these pipe-like fluid pathways. For relays, they're parallel to the slip vector. Jogs tend to be at high angles to the slip vector. Branch lines may have all sorts of orientations. Knowing the orientation relationship between pipe-like pathways and fault slip directions are critical features in targeting mine planning and grade control. So that's all stages of the exploration and production process. The seismic styles in overpressure hydrothermal systems are very interesting. Deep fluid injection experiments tell us, as long as natural contemporary uh, seismicity, that the characteristic response to injection of large volumes of overpressure fluids into low permeability rocks is what we call injection-driven swarm seismicity. There's a diagram here from a natural earthquake swarm in 19, um, sorry, 2009 in Japan, Hakone Caldera. Seismicity started on a small fault here, jumped across onto this fault here, then jumped onto there and migrated. Over a period of several days, there were thousands of earthquake events. If we study these swarm systems, we find that the net slip on the fault accumulates by thousands of earthquake swarms. Each swarm involves a thousand to maybe 10,000 or even more small ruptures over days to many months, or extreme examples, over a few years. Rupture diameters in these systems typically range from less than a metre up to about a thousand metres in rupture length. That's about the limit. That's about a magnitude four earthquake. The slips are typically less than about one millimetre up to several centimetres during each swarm. As shown in the Hakone example, there's actually a diffusion-like migration in seismicity with time. So it started here, migrated with time along here, then jumped along this structure and migrated along it. The migration rates are typically hundreds of metres per day. So the net slip and the ore accumulates during periods of 10,000 to 100,000 years. And this is shown by recurrence intervals of swarms in both magmatic hydrothermal systems and in systems sourced from deeper fluid sources. What we also see from current seismicity in these systems is that there are extreme dynamics of flow and reaction in these systems. The flow is episodic, large flow of tens of litres per second to hundreds of litres per second over days to weeks. There's large fluid pressure fluctuations, repeated sudden changes in stress state as we rupture, re-rupture, and there's sudden transient changes in both flow rates 
and flow directions in these systems. So it's a regime dominated by severe chemical disequilibrium. In summary then, in the upper crustal cytogenic regime, fault and fracture related ore formation involves firstly overpressured fluid systems, that is above hydrostatic. The flow regimes are strongly episodic with large and rapid fluctuations in fluid velocity and fluid pressure and flow directions in these systems. Failure episodes, permeable enhancement is driven largely by fluid pressurization. Most flow localizes along pipe-like domains, which have enhanced permeability, such as jogs, relays, branch lines, termination zones, and so forth. And this applies not just to brittle faults, but also the more ductile shear zones. Swarm seismicity is the dominant style of seismicity rather than main shock aftershock sequences in these high pressure systems. So all formation can involve in a fault which is maybe a kilometre long, nearly 100 million or over 100 million small ruptures to generate that deposit. The regime is dominated by severe chemical disequilibrium. There are some implications for what I've talked about for mine development, targeting and grade control. There are two questions I think underpin targeting strategies. Firstly, from a structural sense, what combinations of rock types and structural locations favour the generation of high fracture density high dilation? for the longest time. It may be certain step overs in certain lithologies. Among potentially high permeability sites, we next need to ask where is the highest potential for mineralization involving the various processes which occur during mineralization, such as gradient reactions due to fluctuations in fluid pressure, temperature, gradients, sudden pressure drops, associated with slip events, is there fluid rock reaction, is there fluid mixing going on? We need to think about the chemistry as well as the structural dynamics that's going on. Tactically, these things may um, boil down to three questions. Which structures could have been active and potentially localising fluid flow during mineralisation? So we need to understand regionally what's the kinematics, the stress orientations. And we also need to use alteration geochemistry and vein abundances to help target potential structures. We use the slip directions and stress orientations during the mineralisation process to predict the orientations of high permeability structures, such as dilatant jogs or relays or branch lines. This will tell us which way we've got to direct drilling to get these pipe-like zones of enhanced permeability. Finally, where are the highest permeability and the highest fluid fluxes? Um, where were the highest permeabilities and the highest fluid fluxes in the identified faults and shear zones? So again, we've got to think about where's the competence contrast, which may help localise where fractures form. It may be a contact between a competent and incompetent rock mass, or fractures may localise within a competent rock mass. Additionally, as shown in this diagram over here, where is a reactive stratigraphy? It may be something like a high iron basalt or high iron dolerite, which is controlling a reaction, fluid rock reaction to deposit coal. Where that stratigraphy intersects with a fluid localising structure can also control where mineralisation occurs, the geometry of ore shoots. So these things very much influence both geometry and location of loads. Thank you very much and happy hunting. Well, thanks very much, um, Stephen. That was a fantastic talk. And um, I'd encourage people, if, if you're looking for exquisite um, cartoons that really identify geometry uh, and the relationship between fluid flow and the geometry, the orientation of structures you might be looking for in the field. That is a fantastic chapter to look at. So thanks very much, Stephen. And I'd also like to um, highlight Dave's chapter for the same reasons. So Dave's already been introduced earlier on, so I don't feel the need to introduce him except to say that here's a guy who has seen a huge amount of, um, of mineral deposits from a structural perspective. And um, this is his, uh, his paper really, on um, epithermal systems. And again, it's superbly illustrated. And so uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to say today. Over to you, Dave. Hello, everybody. I'm gonna do a run through today of the flavor of our structural controls on uh, epithermal deposits paper uh, from the review volume. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Peter Lewis and Julie Rowland. So epithermal deposits are deposits that are formed typically in arc environments or rift environments uh, within a kilometer of paleo surface at, at uh, temperatures of less than about 300 degrees Celsius. So these are high level uh, environments that these deposits form in. They're typically divided into low and intermediate sulfidation classifications, which are often vein systems from, formed from neutral pH meteoric water that's diluted from uh, 
ultimate magmatic sources, um, and also high sulfidation systems, which form from uh, the condensates of uh, magmatic volatiles from underlying magma chambers. And so these are often associated with acidic fluids, which often create an early structural permeability associated with residual silica alteration. Typically, these deposits show an increasing uh, degree of structural control with depth, which is associated with increasing differential stress um, and also decreasing primary porosity um, as uh, older rock units and uh, typically are more lithified and less porous. So if we look at high sulfidation systems, these are often associated with uh, synvolcanic faults or, or with, uh, with breaches such as phreatic breaches, which, which feed uh, mineralization that can be often stratabound and uh, affect uh, uh, rock units with high primary porosity. So these occur often below lithocaps. You can see in the upper left here areas of advanced argillic alteration, which often have uh, associated with them areas of residual uh, of fuggy silica. You can see through here, which uh, form that secondary porosity, which mineralization can preferentially exploit often at the base of the lithocap. You can often also see hydraulic breaches and uh, hydrothermal breaches along the base of the lithocap too, which can localize mineralization from these stratabound zones. Along fault systems, we also see breaches. Uh, some of these can be void filling breaches here too, like we see on the left. Um, and you can see here is these can be filled often with geopedal textures, which can generate quite high grades in these areas called creamy silica alteration. So these fault systems uh, really are feeding uh, the strata bound zones and often form these silicified ribs as you see in the lower left. In intermediate and low sulfidation systems, these typically form uh, often above fault systems, normal fault systems in particular, which uh, become more steeply dipping as we approach the paleo surface due to decreasing differential uh, uh, stress and changing failure mode from shear failure at depth to more extensional failure near the surface, which is an ideal environment also for dilatancy to allow boiling uh, in these environments, which are is one of the main depositional processes for precious metals in these settings. These often bifurcate upwards as they approach the paleo surface. And in these environments too, the uh, alteration associated with the system with the upflow zones and the, uh, and the, the near the paleo surface can have significant influence on fracture permeability and maintenance throughout the formation of the vein system. So you can see here, these areas of gray hard alteration, when we stain them, have a lot of agillary in them and that adularia alteration in the upflow zone maintains that fracture permeability since it's competent versus the clay alteration that sits above can be uh, impermeable and act also to as a cap, a rheologically weak cap above, which can confine the vein system. As we look at the patterns of these vein systems, you can see uh, these areas where we have hydrothermal cells defined by vein networks. You can see in the blue outlines and through here, which often form these intersecting networks, uh, as Tom Blankensop was referring to earlier. And in some of these environments, as we see in Waihi, where we have quite concentrated, concentrated mineralization, we see more than one orientation of faults that was active coevally, suggesting either the influence of triaxial strain and polymodal faulting or the interaction of faults of different uh, generations that may be partly influenced by basement rocks. But these concentrated zones of veining often have um, uh, associated with faults that have displacements of between 50 and 300 meters in the larger faults and districts, which uh, host the largest veins, and which have displacement that terminates at the margin of the district, suggesting localized extension in these districts, perhaps related to underlying magmatic centers and volumetric changes associated with those. If we look at ore shoot controls in these environments, we can often see in normal fault settings that we have fault relays. Here you can see these steeply plunging relays, which are developed through the linkage of initially on echelon uh, fault segments, which form steeply dipping uh, plunging zones that are parallel to the slope direction, as Stephen Cox was alluding to as well. We also form these more gently plunging ore shoots, which can occur either through the bifurcation of the vein system as it approaches the paleo surface or paleo surface and uh, uh, becomes more and more extensional in its mode 
uh, as the differential stress decreases, or dilational jogs that are associated with normal faulting. And both of these gently plunging ore shoots can occur at high angles to the slip direction. Some of the illustrations are shown to the left. Even in strike-slip environments, we often form vein systems that are in normal faults in dilational segments between more regional strike-slip faults. So we still see these same kinds of patterns in strike-slip environments. If we look at how some of these manifest, here's a nice gently plunging ore shoot in uh, the Palmarejo district, which is occurring due to a steepening of the fault system associated with mineralization. Here you can see in cross section, it's just a subtle steepening of only about 10 or 15 degrees, but is enough to generate a dilational zone here. And we see the changes in the style of the fault and mineralization as we go in different parts of the system, from nice veins in the steeper segments here to clay alteration along the fault system at the, at the, at the upper part here in points D and E, which really don't look like a lot at surface, not telling you that you have a great ore body at depth. But as you approach the ore body in more deeply eroded areas, you can start to see adularia alteration in through here, which is nice and competent and allows um, not only a definition of the uh, flow zone, but also a nice competent substrate for the maintenance of the dilatancy of the fracture permeability in this vein system. Here on the left, we can see a nice dilational jog where the Chapatillo fault vein system steepens up and um, fans into a series of extensional veins. In the Waihe district, we can see this concentrated area of veining, which was alluded to before, which is generated through the linkage of these fault relays. You can see in this pattern on the upper left is, is mimicked here in the shapes of some of the vein systems that are outlined in the old workings in through here. So we have these nice plunging ore shoots here that are steep at these intersections and relay points. But also, too, we have the gentle plunge of the whole system in here at the sigma-2 orientation, which is at the intersection of a lot of the extension veins and smaller veins with the main fault fill veins in through here, which is also incidentally the intersection of the vein system with stratigraphy. So these are very common controls and to help concentrate these areas of, of mineralization in these very uh, uh, productive districts. Here are some of the textures that we see associated with this dynamic permeability um, uh, that we see associated with uh, the vein systems, which can re create these areas of or periods of, of extremely high fluid flux, which can create these cockade textures of, of suspended armored breccia fragments, which get coatings of, of mineralized material. Transitions from cataclastic breccias to hydrothermal breccias and veins as we have rupture episodes, which occur cyclically, as you can see on the lower left here and also to these beautiful uh, polyphase vein systems, which record these increments of opening from uh, coliform, cruciform textures, a small opening to more, uh, more violent uh, uh, periods of, of brecciation and high fluid flux along the fault vein system. And between periods of high fluid flux, faulting can uh, form these foliated cataclasites, and we even can form these uh, pressure solution foliations in these uh, environments which record the positions of the faults and then are affected by hydrothermal alteration minerals and preserved. So in conclusion, epithermal deposits um, are uh, typically found in normal fault systems in all environments we see even in contractional arcs. They often form perpendicular to the arc. Um, they conform to the regional patterns but often are in areas of localized extension. And often, too, people try to use strike-slip models in these environments, and they tend to be overutilized and allow us to perhaps miss targets uh, or, or shoots in these environments, which can be gently plunging, such as upper bifurcation and steepening uh, of vein systems as they approach the paleo surface, creating those nice extensional vein tips near the surface, or down dip dilational jogs uh, in normal falls, which are also gently plunging, um, and uh, which together form these nice environments near the paleo surface for boiling and are blind to the surface. Steeply plunging ore shoots often occur in lateral relays and linkage zones or branch lines and intersections, possibly related to intersections of faults of different orientations that have different generations or perhaps triaxial strain and influence of, of, uh, in these low differential stress environments of different uh, um, extensional um, uh, influences regionally or locally uh, uh, associated with these deposits. The alteration assemblages have a fundamental influence on the structural style 
and we have often see adularia quartz alteration or silicification maintaining that structural permeability uh, in these environments, forming these nice competent alteration assemblages surrounded by cool areas of impermeable incompetent clay alteration, which change the structural style and permeability of the system. So we often need to assess the 3D kinematic and lithological architecture of the district to really understand where these deposits form. So anyway, thank you for your time. Well, th uh, thank you very much, Dave. <laughs> um, we'll move on now to uh, uh, Bruno LaFrance, um, who uh, is a professor of structural geology at the Harkwell School of Mines and Earth Sciences. Hello, everybody. I'm going to do a run through. Oh, I think we have uh, some repetition here. So uh, um, Bruno's uh, approach uh, is to uh, look at the primary controls on the formation of ore deposits and their subsequent modification during orogenic events. Um, although most of his research has been on gold and volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits, uh, Bruno uh, has also researched Today, the structural uh, controls. The flavor on the formation of a nickel copper PGE deposit in Sudbury, Ontario. Um, Bruno holds a PhD uh, from the University of New Brunswick and a BSc degree from the University of Montreal. Uh, he was one of the team members who proposed uh, and uh, implemented and is now involved with the implementation of a successful Metal Earth project. Structural modification of VMS deposits. What are VMS deposits? VMS deposits are a combination of sulfide minerals that formed by the exhalation of hydrothermal fluids and the deposition of metals at or near the seafloor. They are typically strata bound and associated with volcanic rock, and they have simple sulfide mineralogy consisting of pyrite, pyrotite, chalcopyrite, sphalerite, and galena. The paper discusses the microscale, mesoscale, regional scale modification of VMS deposits. So fine minerals are very weak. They are typically weaker than silicate minerals, and they undergo the brittle ductile transition at temperatures as low as 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. So the formation tends to get localized within VMS lenses. Pyrite, which is the strongest of the sulfide minerals. It deforms at Grinch's fascist by cataclysis. It forms, it becomes fragmented and forms layers of, of uh, pyrite fragments. At amphibolite fascist, pyrite becomes more ductile and recrystallized to form triple point junction. And that's an example from the Photo Lake deposit in Snow Lake, Manitoba, to the right. Most other sulfides, though, are more ductile than pyrite even at Grinch's fascist, and they will experience extensive plastic deformation and recrystallization, which can mask prior deformation of the VMS lenses, although they may have been very strongly deformed, as is the case of the Chisel Lake deposit in Snow Lake, Manitoba. What are the most common mesoscale deformation structures in VMS deposits? One is tectonic sulfide breccia, which consists of class of the surrounding rock, of the surrounding volcanic rock, within a flowing mass matrix of sulfides. They have to be dis distinguished from primary breccias that can also be associated with VMS lenses and that form by the collapse of the, of the VMS lenses. Tectonic foliation along the margin of sulfide lenses then formed by isoclinal folding and transposition of bedding, but within the interior of the lens can form by the flattening and shearing of primary heterogeneities. And that's an example here, the photograph of a very strong tectonic foliation with the, in the sulfide uh, Cullinan deposit. Sulfides are very weak, so shearing will get localized along VMS lenses. And so we can see structures very similar to magnetic structures we would see in silicate rock. An example is a Schismendi deposit, which lies along a shear zone. Here we can see transpose sphalerite, sphalerite layers that have been transposed parallel to the mineral foliation, 
And we can see as well shear strength indicators with asymmetrical strain shadow around a class. Microscale tectonic structures in VMS deposit. Now, VMS deposits are syngenetic, which means that they have undergone the same deformation history as their host volcanic rock. In this case, the host volcanic rocks and the BC conglomerates have undergone very strong elongation parallel to a stretching nation, and so has the volcanic lenses that define chigar shaped lenses parallel to the stretching nation. Or shoot can also form parallel to the axis of regional fault due to ductile flow and the transfer of sulfide by mechanical flow from the limbs that undergo flexural slip into the hinge of the fault. So as can be seen in the battery scan, where the limbs are thinner, the sulfide lenses are in the limbs are thinner than along the hinge of the fault. Stacking of EMS lenses can be tectonic and occur by thrusting and fault transposition. Good example is a little deposit in Snow Lake where the sulfide lenses have been tightly folded and transposed parallel to the actual plane of the fault. But stacking can also be primary. And this is an example from the Noranda camp where the stack stacking results from the upward flow of hydrothermal fluid across the early form sulfide lens followed by the formation of the new sulfide lens in the hanging wall of the older lens. In this case, the stacking is primary and there is no repetition of stratigraphy. If the stacking is by thrusting, then there is repetition of stratigraphy. If the stacking is by full transposition, then there will be both repetition and inversion of stratigraphy. The paper also offers insights on mapping in VMS scan. First, you must define the volcanic stratigraphy. You should always map the lithologies at the same time as you map the structures. Why? Because some of the earlier structures within the VMS camp can only be recognized through repetition of stratigraphy. Second, you should map and define fabrics and fault generation in interleaf sedimentary rock, and then correlate with those in volcanic rock. Why is because Fabric structures are usually better deformed, better expressed within sedimentary rock. And then you can define a sequence of deformation events, sequence of generation of structures that you can then correlate with structures within the volcanic rock. This is seen here within conglomerate volcanic rock where shape fabric is defined by flattening of the class. Here, the flattening of the pillow. In both cases, they are overprinted by a late cleavage. And third, you need to be aware of strain partitioning in weak altered zone within competent volcanic rock because that can result in the, in the multiple reactivation of shear zones that have localized themselves within those weak altered zones. An example is from the Clinton camp where we have two system of thrust fault. One is north directed and follows the mine horizon. When we look on vertical session, we have very good evidence of trusting with the mean synchronization defined by the flattening of the class being rotated, suggesting north direct uh, trusting. But when we look at horizontal surfaces, what we see is evidence of textual transfer and movement, and that's due to reactivated of the shear zone. And in many cases, we only see the latest shear shed indicators within the shear zone. So some final thoughts. Primary features of EMS deposit affect the development of tectonic structures over printing the deposit. The strong ductility of most common sulfides can result in the preferential localization of the strain or the shear within the sulfide lens themselves. Structures in VMS deposit can have both primary and tectonic origin. For example, we look at stacking or the formation of breccia. And it's essential to be able to recognize primary structures from tectonic structures in VMS lenses. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bruno. I think that's a, a, a super um, talk and an excellent chapter illustrating the importance of a, a, a consideration of rheology. In, in what we're looking at. And of course, that, that 
uh, insight goes well beyond um, VMS deposits as well. But that's a, a fantastic chapter for people to take a look at. I'd like to now introduce Dick Tosdall on the creation of permeability in the porphyry copper uh, environment. Dick received a bachelor's degree from the University of California, an MSc degree from Queen's University, and his doctorate from the University of California at Santa Barbara. And I have to say, Santa Barbara seems to have been a place that was really inspirational for a lot of people at a particular time. And I'm sure there's a story there that we need to hear about. Um, Dick uh, worked for the US Geological Survey and was the director of the Mineral Deposit Research Unit at the University of British Columbia. Dick's currently a consultant to the minerals industry on the metallogenic evolution of plate margins, structural controls on ore deposition, and evolution of a range of hydrothermal deposits. He serves on technical advisory boards, is active in facilitating industry designed research and development projects. So welcome, Dick. Looking forward to hearing your talk. I, what I'd like to talk a little bit about today is the uh, destruction and creation of permeability in the port for copper environment. This is a much abridged version of what was presented in the SCG conference and as well as it encapsulated in the reviews volume. Here is a picture of the Glower Creek area in British Columbia if you've never enjoyed working in that part of the world. So structure is important in a range of environments in the porphyry and magmatic systems. It's crucial in the formation of the upper crustal magma chamber, setting up the pressure and temperature regime in the magma and fluid carapace, separation and collection of hydrothermal fluid in the cupola, cracking of the cupola roof permitting fluid ascent, the episodic rise of the magmatic and hydrothermal fluid, and magma, the solu mineral solubility and hydrothermal reactions that create and destroy permeability. It strongly controls any lateral flow. It also influences the thermally driven circulation of the external uh, geothermal fluids, and as well as any sort of contemporary exhalation and modifications of the porphyry copper environment. So just to talk about as a parts of that, and this is the, construction of the pluton and how the magma gets out and how the fluid gets out. The first order of business is to, is to raise the geothermal gradients. This is done by putting a lot of magma into the crust. The early magma will crystallize quickly, and but allowing young successive batches of magma to begin to convect, exhaust the supercritical fluid and collect all the goodies that, that travel upwards with magma towards the porphyry environment. So the convecting magma um, collects fluid at the top. On the lower right is a picture of a fluid saturated roof. And on the middle photo is the cupola contact. It's convecting, it's scouring its roof. It forms a um, fluid saturated carapace and the magma begins to crack on the carapace. And this is done largely through uh, external uh, action such as the intrusion of more magma at depth or the passage of seismic energy. These have both been recorded in magma chambers and in the emplacement of dikes. So in the porphyry environment, fluid starts at the, near the upper contact and with each excessive batch comes out from deeper and deeper in the magma chamber leading to very different fluid compositions when it arrives at the site of, of metal deposition in the porphyry copper deposit. So how do the dikes intrude once they exit out of this chamber? Well, we can thank the physical volcanology world for, for monitoring magma movement. On, on the left slide there, you can see the various beach ball showing, showing the, the tensional axis recorded in the front of a propagating dike. This is, this is recorded in microseismicity with the open circles being the oldest and closed circles being the youngest. And you can see that basically the fractures in front of a propagating dike are open based upon whatever the regional far field stress environment is. Once magma rests and, it, and you're still putting magma into the crust, into the, into the chamber there or up, up the dike or stock or whatever, it begins to expand. It pushes the rocks out on the side and, you, and basically you start to get ten, tensional strain 
around the margins of the diet, and that's what we see. So here's an example of one from, from the North E27 deposit of North Parks. You can see the, the black lines, the vertical black lines. This is just after a rain. They're very much concentrated over the top of the orange Monsonite intrusion. You can see the little thin dike is coming up and is just basically pushing aside. So really, in the end, what we know is the fracture mesh is in front. The fluid is leading and the magma is just following along. So if we look at the change that one sees in the fracture geometry, which is really the vein distribution, you can see in the series of slides done by a PhD student, Lisa garcia Quison, and you can see the top one is the shallowest level in the rich way deposit, and the bottom one is the deepest level. You can see there is a dominant orientation. This is the far field. It sort of strikes up to the upper left corner, more towards the west northwest. And but around the margins, you can see the dikes are and the veins are oriented at high angle to that orientation. You go down to the lower one, you see that that sheeted vein orientation dominates right through the middle of the deposit, but you still have the veins oriented at high angles to that. That's basically what we just looked at in the physical, from the physical volcanology world, where magma is cracking in front. In the front is those green colored blobs that you see down in the lower, lower, lower two. And then as it expands, it's pushing out in all directions. And this leads to the very characteristic geometry and porphyry systems. So what we see, the vein, Geometry or the vein character in the porphyries is very much dependent upon the depth at which fluid is coming out of the magma chamber. At great depth, you know, six to eight, six to nine kilometers, it never really undergoes, it doesn't hit the solvus, it never really undergoes catastrophic um, phase separation. So there's not a great volume expansion. So you end up with these characteristic sparse veins, but many of which look more like the EDM veins that are shown down on the lower right. Fluid exhaust from the shallower depth undergoes rapid uh, phase separation that leads to volume expansion, leads to tremendous hydrofracting, which you see in the upper right hand corner. So really the vein characteristic of porphyries is very much a function of the depth at which fluid is, it, is separating from the underlying magnet chamber. So I'll leave that with the last slide. The structure plays a very important role in the formation of porphyries, primarily influenced permeability, but it also is important in the magma chain. They seem to form during times of tectonic transitions, that is, you know, in times when there's not a heck of a lot of deformation going on in, in, the, in the area where these are being in place. In order to have the flip-flopping um, extension directions you, you, to form the veins, you have to be really in an area of low differential stress in which the magmatic driven stress, that is expansion of the, of the, of the dike or the, the stock really exceeds and overrides any sort of effect of the far field. However, the far field controls the dominant vein geometry, but the lesser ones are controlled by the, by the volume expansion. So really the geometry, the permeability of the veins per se in the portal system are very much controlled by the tectonics as well as magma stress. Thank you very much. And Thank you very much, Dick, for that extremely informative talk, which really goes a long way to explaining uh, where and what sort of morphology we might anticipate in exploring for uh, porphyry systems uh, globally. Just an excellent overview. Um, our next uh, talk is uh, Wayne Barnett, who will be now uh, presenting uh, the first of a series of talks in practical applications of structure uh, in, uh, in, from the volume here. And Wayne is uh, with SRK Consulting. Uh, he has 20 years of experience in the mining and exploration industry as a mining operations-based uh, geotechnical engineer and applied structural geologist. 
He specializes in defining the structural geology of uh, mining projects in order to properly characterize the rock mass for geotechnical engineer engineering applications, scoping to pre-feasibility studies, as well as problem solving in active mining operations. Wayne is a geological modeling expert and undertakes to provide training in structural and geotechnical uh, drill core logging, open pit and underground mapping, geological data management, data QA, QC, and statistical analysis of structural data. And having worked with Wayne, I can can say that he has just a, a, an extremely broad experience and application of all these techniques and a, a very a very good guy to be working with. So Wayne, please uh, queue up Wayne's presentation. Hi, I'm Wayne Barnett with SOK Consulting, and I'm talking on behalf of our lead author, Julia Cromer Bernard, as well as Ron Yukon and Russell Myers. We're talking about the publication uh, submitted and published in 2020 uh, on the structural analysis of drill core for mineral exploration and mining, with an emphasis on the review of uh, technologies and workflows towards the domain-based 3D interpretation. So diamond drill core is arguably the most important source of data for pre-mining development at a deposit scale. The exploration and mining projects commonly do not introduce oriented core and robust structural logging techniques at the early stages, often simply to reduce costs. Our paper's emphasis is on the collection and interpretation of good geological data and building knowledge rather than the mechanical aspects of drill core logging. Introduction to newer technological approaches and quality controls on structural data collection from drill core is also emphasized. The usefulness of oriented core and televiewer is discussed. Our objective is to establish the geological controls on the spatial distribution of mineralization or on the zones of weakness that influence the geotechnical engineering aspects of a project. We do need data, but data is useless without turning it into knowledge. And this needs to start happening during data collection, not only afterwards. So here is data in two different drill holes. There's many ways we can interpret this data. It could be shear zone hosted uh, vein system. It could be an epithermal vein system. It could be an orogenic fold and thrust system. It could be a post-vein mineralization deformation zone. Uh, or it could be something else a little bit more interesting. If our objective is to make a 3D interpretation to des decide how to proceed on a particular project, how would we, for example, connect all these drill holes up to make something useful? We need information, knowledge about the system. Or if we had these two drill holes and we're trying to test an idea and position a new drill hole, we'll need some sort of knowledge gained from the previous holes that will help us with that decision-making process. The question is, is the drill hole data organized enough to retain and create knowledge? So when we talk about structural core mapping, we're talking about the logging process, but where we've actually making observations while we're logging, we're interpreting those observations, and then we're in testing the interpretation. And we go through a cyclical process of observation, interpretation, and testing. And we may be walking up or down the drill core to find evidence or ideas and interpretations that we might have. Particularly useful in an exploration environment where we're looking for all controls. So there are four basic things we need to know. We need to determine the timing of mineralization relative to the structural events and identify those events that are of interest, such as those that produce mineralization. We need to determine the structural setting and pattern of the active structures during mineralization. We need to determine the likely shapes, orientations, and locations of dilation sites on the active structures. And we would like to know the continuity of the structures, although we are unlikely to get that from one drill hole alone. We need to look at the a collection of drill holes in 3D. So how do we achieve our objective when the loggers collecting the data are typically young, inexperienced, 
highly trained geologists. Or we know that all human observations are biased and that poor core preservation is common from drilling programs where they don't look after the core appropriately. There's also a disconnect between the data collectors at the drill core and those people who are building and interpreting the model in 3D. So how do we get the knowledge from the core to be applied in the 3D model? Here's an excellent example of an observation in the core showing a tight fold system associated with mineralization. And then when we look at the drill core on a much larger scale for the same project, we see the same pattern demonstrating the geometry and the control on the mineralization. In this case, illustrating why perhaps locally there is no um, continuity because of the fold shape. So our solutions to our problems include that we must apply a structural mapping approach to logging, where we identify timing relationships and patterns. We have uh, increased the structural geology training to those people collecting data on the drill core. We have oriented core structural data, which has much have it must have a strong quality control process to make sure that the quality of the data is good. We can use new technological scanning systems, some of which are helping reduce human bias. We can develop our knowledge, challenge the knowledge, and organize knowledge by grouping observations into domain categories. So, for example, this is a high strain shear zone domain uh, with deformed quartz veins associated with mineralization. If we can follow the same domain from one drill hole to the next, we will be able to develop a better understanding of the controls and mineralization and be able to target it. The uh, porphyry um, systems are, have co commonly well-developed alteration domain zones that have been recognized for years. And that sort of domain classification is important to, to use uh, and uh, as a classification in your draw call logging. With oriented core, we can also get the kinematics and fault zones, and we can measure and unravel the deformation history of this multiply folded deformation zone. Here's an example with timing relationships where one vein system is older and has no mineralization, and here's a cross cutting vein system with mineralization, clearly showing the relative timing of mineralization. We also have introduced a classification system for logging faults to improve the consistency and reliability of the fault structural data, which is also designed to help with the fault interpretation decisions in 3D modeling, considering the confidence of the fault observations themselves. Using that information, we can more reliably build our 3D interpretations. In summary, core logging truly adds value when the approach focuses on creating knowledge, not just data. The data value of acquiring oriented core outweighs the fiscal costs in many deposits and is often priceless. Although relatively straightforward, the acquisition of oriented core can be prone to errors due to lack of drilling and logger experience. Thanks very much, um, Julia, Wayne, Ron, and Russell for putting that um, chapter together, and Wayne for um, doing the honours of, of, of telling the story. I mean, it's a it's a, a great. I know that my students have found that a particularly interesting chapter in terms of trying to understand some of the workflows in relation to working with uh, core. And I think there's some salutary lessons for people in that chapter. So thanks very much for that talk. Uh, I think we're moving on now. Deanne, to the next one, to Paul Stenhouse on recognition and integration of structural controls in 3D geological modeling. And this talk follows on really nicely uh, from uh, the one that Wayne's just uh, uh, given. Paul is currently an independent structural geology consultant. He completed a BSc Honours degree at the University of Otago in 2002 and a PhD degree at uh, ANU in 2014. Paul has uh, worked as an exploration geologist for several precious and base metal exploration companies uh, prior to his PhD studies. 
And after then, uh, he spent five years working as a senior consultant with SRK Consulting in the UK. During this time, Paul's worked on a variety of commodities and deposit styles and contributed to mineral projects that have ranged from greenfields exploration through to production. And since becoming an independent consultant in 2017, Paul's primarily worked on orogenic gold deposits throughout Africa and Australia. And uh, this particular talk is going to scale up from where uh, uh, Wayne was talking at the core scale. Uh, welcome, Paul. So the aim of the chapter that this talk is based on was to provide some practical guidance for 3D modeling of mineral deposits, particularly for those who don't 3D model regularly or who are new to the industry. So the first question my co-authors and I faced was, is there actually a correct process for 3D modeling? And when we went back through all the projects we worked on, the modeling workflows we used varied so much depending on the specifics of the project that we decided that being too prescriptive was pointless. So in the end, we settled on a three-step process that was very broad, but served as a useful way to organize the chapter. These steps were one, establish a geological framework, two, model the project scale geology, and three, model the ore shoots. Now I should say up front that this three-step process is not a one-way system. And what you discover during the different stages of modeling should be constantly fed back into the geological framework to see which observations and interpretations support the current understanding and which challenge it. Now, I'd hope that amongst the audience today, it's something of a truism that a robust understanding of a project's geology is an essential foundation for any 3D model. And for that reason, I'm not going to deal with it any further. Instead, I want to take this opportunity to, to emphasize the importance of the modeling geologist. The finalized 3D model is essentially a series of subjective judgments and decisions. And it's often the quality of those decisions that makes the difference between a good model and a poor model especially where data density is poor. So what makes a good modeling geologist? Well, firstly, they need to have a good understanding of the project's geology. And this point is particularly important where modeling is done off-site. And in my opinion, it's difficult to find a good substitute for that direct connection to the geology that comes from field work. Secondly, training and experience are important. The box plots on the right of this slide are from a PhD thesis by Ewan Cray. His research looked at interpretations of a seismic reflection image by more than 700 geologists. And as you can see from the plots, the y-axis in these graphs is essentially a measure of the quality of the interpretation, and they clearly suggest a link between the level of training and specialist experience of the geologist and the quality of the interpretation. And obviously, if you can't use the software, then that will probably lead to problems. Data. So when the primary data sets for a 3D model is subjective, such as visual logging, data reliability can be a key constraint for model confidence. This is demonstrated in the figure on this slide, which is a 3D view looking down dip on a shared ultramafic dike network, shown as dashed lines. Now this network was a key control on the distribution of gold in this project. And all the different colored cylinders on the figure represent different logging codes that were assigned to the unit, depending on various variations in strain, alteration, and weathering. Now, if you assume during modeling that these different codes are all distinct units, then you're going to miss one of the key controls on the deposit. So at its worst, bad data will produce a nonsense model or limit you to simply linking assays. But even if it's not that bad, problems with your data will lower overall confidence and drive you towards semi-implicit or explicit modeling workflows. Thankfully, the increasing availability and use of quantitative data sets is helping to remove a lot of the noise in our data, and in doing so, increasing model confidence and opening up more implicit modeling workflows and multivariate techniques. Project scale modeling, oops. I'm not gonna to say too much about this because I think it's fairly straightforward. The key point here is that initial 3D visualization interpretation should usually start at the project scale 
And when you try to reduce this process down to its essence, it's really just about finding the right subjects of data and the right viewing angles to highlight key modeling units and their geometry. As an example of this concept, the figure on this slide is from the Tuzon Gold Deposit in Liberia, where the geometry of mineralization is primarily, primarily controlled by two phases of folding. Both figures show a thick section comprising several drill fences and are looking down plunge on the F3 fold axis. The thick section on the left shows the original codes, which are generally reasonable, but make it hard to see the key project scale geometries. However, when we simplify the logging codes to either Felsic or Mafic nice, the fold geometry shown by the dash line becomes a lot clearer. It's also worth noting that some deposits will have multiple viewing directions, like in the example below from Rebecca Strawn's masters on the Wassa gold mine in Ghana. Now, in plan view that they show in this figure, a project scale F4 fold can be pretty clearly seen, but this fold is much more difficult to observe in section where the geometry is dominated by F3 folds. And once you have the project scale geometries sorted out. The final step is usually having a look at any residual zones of complexity and understanding the controls on any ore shoots. If the location and orientation of your ore shoots is not yet clear, then this can usually be sorted out by some combination of interpolating assay data with an existing wireframe, testing different anisotropies, and using gram meter values or different compositing methods to emphasize the economically most significant intercepts. In terms of understanding the controls on the ore shoots, like the rest of the 3D modeling process, there's no set way to go about this. But it's worth remembering that there's a change in scale here. So units that were grouped during project scale modeling may need to be split. And local complexities that were previously overlooked may need to be reviewed again. If possible, it's often best to start with robust empirical observations. For example, the figure on this slide shows a long section from the Elag gold mine in Mali. And you can see that there's a strong empirical relationship between the location and orientation of ore shoots and divergence of the hanging wall carbonate shown as dashed colored lines. Now, obviously causal explanations of ore shoots can also be useful for conceptual targeting, particularly if you can reduce them to a more abstract or fundamental level but they're also more likely to change while the empirical observations will hopefully be more stable. And finally, I just want to touch on model validation, which is a key step in the development of any 3D model. Exactly what that validation process might look like will vary depending on the geology of the project and the aim of the model. In petroleum exploration, 2D and 3D structural balancing is complex. But while this approach can certainly work on some mineral deposits, in deposits which lack marker units that have complex and poorly quantified deformation histories, it can be difficult to impossible. However, if you look at the work by Claire Bond and colleagues, they've demonstrated a strong link between thinking about interpreted deformation histories and correct interpretations. So some attempts to relate the model to the interpreted deformation history is clearly important. At its simplest, this could just be attempting to sketch the deformation history that you think led to your model geometries. Alternatively, you could also use forward modeling tools that vary from relatively simple, like the Noddy software, to more advanced, like the Move Suite. And while this sort of process is a useful check for the modeling geologist, for models with particularly significant implications, you may want to go down the path of a more structured validation process. Well, that's my time up. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for an excellent practical talk on really how to approach the understanding and modeling of uh, ore deposits and really follows with what uh, Wayne was uh, also speaking about, which shows that purely data driven approaches can lead you to wrong answers and really you need to have a smart approach to uh, understanding the structural history and, and controls on your systems, which takes into account not only the sequence of structures that are formed and their styles, but also the lithology and the influence on, uh, on the whole rock mass.
So I'd like to now introduce our, our final talk of the session, uh, James Sidorn, uh, who will be speaking uh, about uh, airborne uh, geophysical approaches uh, for particularly for originic gold deposits. James uh, is with SRK Consulting. He's a recognized expert in the structural geological analysis of mineral deposits with over 20 years of experience. He develops a applied structural uh, solutions to understanding of uh, deposit scale controls on ore plunge and precious and base metal deposits, the district scale geological interpretation of geophysical data for exploration targeting and applied uh, 3D geological modeling. And his strength is in brownfields exploration and operational assistance, providing both training and advancing the geological understanding and its impact on near mine exploration, resource uh, reserve definition, and geotechnical engineering. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this overview of the paper on the integrated geological and geophysical interpretation of district scale frameworks. This was a contribution uh, from Peter Williams, Dave Isles, Lee Rankin and myself, and I'm going to give you a brief, brief overview. Key foundation to this paper is that determining the district scale morphology of structural networks is key to any regional exploration uh, strategy particularly in hydrothermal systems, where we're looking at the distribution of structures that form the plumbing network uh, to control the, the flow of hydrothermal fluids through the Earth's crust. The interpretation of aeromagnetic data provides a key link between what we're exploring for in our exploratory reflection models and the potentially prospective geology that we plan to explore. This paper focused on aeromagnetic data interpretation because it's particularly useful as the scale of the data is normally very broad, it covers a significant area. Many geological processes and features are well imaged in the aeromagnetic data, uh, strategic and structures, for example, even undercover. And aeromagnetic data is relatively cheap to acquire process relative to other geophysical techniques. The paper focused on the indirect targeting approach that is looking to define the geological and structural architecture and evolution of the era, for example, the deformation events, different intrusive events with, of the exploration area in question, and then tying that back to the styles and, and types of mineralization that we're exploring for. The key, uh, key points that are very important to the interpretation process. One is that the interpreter should be a ge geoscientist familiar with the geology of the area in question. This maximizes the ability to integrate the first-hand knowledge of the area into the interpretation product. The interpretation should employ geological rules. We're looking to define a, a geological interpretation, a geological map from the data itself. It should incorporate geological relationships. It could be lithological contacts, intrusive contacts, unconformable contacts structural patterns and cross-cutting relationships. So it's very key to understand the deformation area of the uh, deformation uh, history of the area, both what's published in literature or known about the area and what we see within the data itself. And it's important to remember that the patterns we observe in the data relate directly to the 3D distribution of magnetic minerals in the subsurface, either directly as magnetic minerals themselves or, or within different uh, magnetic characteristics of different lithologies, for example. There are a few key products that we use, and it's very important to work with the geophysicists uh, processing the data to understand uh, different artifacts or the different processing techniques that are used within the data itself. But a few key ones that are always used, which is the total magnetic intensity reduced to pole. That takes out the dipolar nature of the measured field and uh, simulates the effect of vert verticalizing the magnetic field in the survey area. And vertical derivatives. These are uh, filters that sharpen the total magnetic intensity images. They emphasize shallower features and uh, it's particularly good for defining different structures. There are a few others that are listed there that, that are used and the paper itself goes into, into more detail. In terms of the process itself, it's very important before you start doing the interpretation to understand the geological information of the project area, what is known about the geology of the area, that could be on a detail scale, could be on a province scale, in both the geological and geophysical data, uh, that should include a healthy critique of what is known in terms of geological mapping of the area, deformation events in the area, uh, 
uh, getting familiar with, with uh, what is geologically known for the area. In terms of the process steps, there are a few key ones, for mine construction, identification of magnetic rock units, definition of domains, integration with other data sets, identification of structural elements, lithological interpretation, interpretation of the structural framework, and then finally testing or evaluating the, the uh, interpretation. It's very important to remember this is an iterative process, and the later steps that you do lead often to the modification of the early elements that, that you've drawn, and we're focused on drawing an interpretation in some GIS uh, product that can be used uh, for exploration uh, targeting. The final product should be an integrated geological and structural map uh, supplement to geological mapping, not a replacement. It should be enhancement to understand the area in question. And there's another figure there on the right just to give you an overview of the workflow as well. Here's some examples. In the paper, we use the Lake Lefroy uh, area in Western Australia. That's an Archean Eastern Goldfields province, so obviously focused on uh, orogenic gold principally. On the top left, you can see the definition, the definition of form lines. That's the flow of fabric, of, of the uh, magnetic fabric in the area. That could be tectonic fabric, foliations. It could be stratigraphic and the distribution of lithological units. Magnetic rock units uh, to the right, uh, which is focused on defining the key units in the area which define the magnetism. That could be, as shown in here, just some examples of the different, uh, different uh, granitic intrusions. Definition of domains, it could be lithological or structural domains, so dividing things into different uh, areas of patterns. Definition of structures, could be folds, could be shear zones, could be faults, uh, looking at the different ages. It's very important to do the form line interpretation before we get into this step, because often you see subtle features as you're drawing the form lines, which, which you can uh, use to, to highlight subtle structures in the area. The structural framework, which is defining where the major structures are, the different ages of structures, the cross-cutting relationships, so the different colors in that image are actually different ages of structures. And then uh, finally, the lithological interpretation there in, in the bottom right. So these are key steps in, in terms of the interpretation. And obviously, you would look at the other data sets as well, say satellite imagery, for example, to help enhance the uh, interpretation itself. Here's a couple of examples that we used within the paper. On the left is the Superior Province in Canada, so uh, quite a big area of the Superior Province. It's about 75,000 kilometers squared. The focus was on uh, exploring for orogenic gold in the area. And you can see in this example that we've got different ages of structures defined by the colors, uh, different, different uh, order or scale of structures defined by the thickness of lines from major to uh, minor structures to help understand the distribution of uh, structures and then uh, possibly how they're related to gold mineralization. On the right, we have an example from the Zambian Northwest uh, province. That's in the Zambian copper, copper belt, where the focus was on uh, searching for copper cobalt mineralization. It was very key to understand the control on that mineralization by extensional structures. So early in the history of the basins, and its uh, connection to strata bound units, which was strata bound mineralization in key uh, stratigraphic units. And so the original basin architecture was very important in this area. So in, in the bottom right image, you can see the different ages of structures, different folds, different, uh, different faults that are defined there to help understand what the connection would be to the mineralization itself. So thanks for this, uh, listening to this brief overview. Just a couple of things to remember. Defining a geological framework is a prerequisite to effective targeting, and that can be uh, based on particularly the interpretation of aeromagnetic data to produce an integrated uh, geological interpretation of the area. It's important to remember that this is an enhancement to anything that we're doing. It's not to be in substitute for, say, geological mapping. It's just another data set and interpretation that we can use. If it's carried out by a suitably experienced geoscientist, someone who really knows the area, it can be very effective at delivering the regional scale to district scale structural frameworks that are key to generating an effective uh, exploration strategy and are particularly useful uh, in areas under cover.
So thank you for listening to this overview and look forward to chatting to everyone and enjoying the webinar. Thanks. Thanks very much, James, for a very practical overview and really a, a good uh, overview of the, the workflows involved in this kind of interpretation, plus uh, the importance of, of local knowledge on the ground. This, this far too much outsourcing, I think, we see in our industry, which can lead to uh, incorrect answers uh, in the end here. So I think we uh, we were going to go to here are our discount slide. So if you want to buy the volume at the SEG website, and a link has been provided in the chat here, um, then uh, you can use this code here, 22ASGREV21, to get yourself, I believe it's a 20% discount on the volume. So there's our sales pitch. So write that down. You'll have another opportunity to see it uh, shortly here too. So I guess now we're gonna be entering the, the chat. Yeah. So uh, uh, JR and I have uh, a few questions and uh, we, we want to um, uh, get uh, some discussion going between the presenters. Plus we'll probably uh, reiterate a few of the uh, uh, points that came from the uh, Q&A that uh, are relevant to everybody on here. So Jared, would you like to leave off yeah, for that? Well I think we're about to um, just switch the view into if everyone's got that code down and, and just welcome all our panelists on. If we can turn our um, videos on, it'd be great. We'll keep our sound off unless we're talking just to make sure that we haven't got too much feedback for people. But um, I, I do, I, I've got a few questions in mind and uh, which I'd like to put to everybody. And I guess I'm gonna start with one that's a, a real general question. And, and while I'm, I'm asking that question, I just like to, um, thank the audience very much for hanging in there. We've still got over 350 people on this webinar, and that tells me that there is a lot of intellectual ability out there, this incredible amount of brain power. Um, so I'm sure that there must be some questions that are going to fly into our Q&A. So if you've got questions and you spark some thinking, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll try and pick them up as we go. And I know a lot of uh, our panelists have actually already answered some of the questions coming in, but please add them in there. I uh, would love to see some of your questions coming. So the question I'd like to start out is, and it's really a tip of the hat to um, Stephen and Dick, because you, of course, had chapters in the 2014 reviews volume, and they were seminal works. And I recall um, Stephen reading your, um, your chapter in the volume, well, 20 years ago now, when I was doing my PhD, and it was uh, it absolutely was seminal for me, along with Rick Simpson's work. And I know Dick, your your chapter in that volume twenty years ago also is a seminal work, and people have found that incredibly useful. You've been you guys have been in the game for a little while now, so my question to you is: um, over that time, uh, what do you think are the persistent pitfalls that you see uh, catching out? early career and even experienced exploration, exploration geos in relation to applied structural geology. So what are those persistent pitfalls that you see? Uh, will I go first, JR? I can't hear you. Yep, go for it. Go for it, Steve. Yes, that, that, that's a really good question, and, and I think I need a long time to think about it, but something that comes to mind immediately is that these days there seems to be less and less practical field experience available in new graduates. So they have limited experience, limited skills, and I'm finding on mine sites in particular, a lot of mine geologists and even exploration geologists don't have sufficient field skills to make the observations critical things like bedding cleavage versions or how to understand shear sense. So there's this real critical shortage of people who can look at a rock and say, yes, this means that. It's what Wayne said, converting data into knowledge. I think there's a lot of people collecting data and not a lot of the data is good. So that, to me, is a major problem. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. What do you think, Dick? Well, I have, I have to, uh, several bugaboos uh, that I've come across, and, and Dave mentioned one of them is, is the, the simple and mindless application of the Riedel Schur diagram to any and every structural problem in the world, whether it fits or not. And uh, because it has so many degrees of freedom, you can always find it something that fits. 
And, and it just is, it doesn't pay attention to the geology, doesn't pay attention to the hydrothermal alteration. And, and it just, it just, it drives me up one wall and down the next and around the bend. And, uh, and I always have to bite my tongue because I might get pitched out of the, of the, of the, of the you know, the core shed or the mine office. So anyways, I mean, to me, that's the biggest one. And I, I appreciate Dave saying that. So I didn't have to say it myself. <laughs> yeah. well, well, thank and you the know. other, I have one more. Yep. And the other thing is there's too many structural analysis that you see that pay no attention to hydrothermal alteration. It is simply mapping fractures, falls, and whatnot and making an elegant, elegant story and not paying attention to what Bruno highlights, the post-mineral deformation story, the sequencing of temperature and pH and chemical changes that you see going on with any hydrothermal fluid. And it's a simple mind that, well, I got a fault here, I got a fault here, I got this, you got this, and of course they all happen together. And it just, it's, it's, as Steve says, it's a lack of experience, lack of training, and the and the, the mindless application of simple diagrams. Yeah. Hi, Dick. I I very strongly agree with that one. Uh, in too many reports, I'm seeing people go to say mine sites, measure all the faults and all the joints, measure silicon sides, which are nothing to do with mineralization and build a story about the kinematic stream mineralization, which is not based on rigorous analysis. So that, that's a very good point you make. So how do we then help people have confidence? Uh, and obviously training is one area, but then you've got people coming in as early career geos. So it's about confidence and training on the job as well. And, um, and I guess one aspect of that, and I know I felt this as a young early career person, I'm sure you guys all did too, and I'm going to spin a question out to Dave around this, but when you get on a site and you're looking at the rock, it can be overwhelming. How do you sort the wheat from the chaff? How do you, how do you sort the signal from the noise? And what gives you confidence? And that's a question for everyone, really. Bruno's a professor. He's got to, and you, you, Julie, you're a professor. You got to teach these people how to do it. The rest of us work for our food. I, I think I think it's one of it's a big difficulty actually for a new graduates to be able to to extrapolate from what they see from one outcrop to the next outcrop. And I don't know that this is something that can be really taught. I think it's experience. I think, I, I think I think the training continues after you graduate. The training has to continue within the, the work environment. Absolutely. And and to, to add to your comments there, Bruno, too, um, and it also depends too, I guess, what your objective is as well as to what kind of uh, if you're if you're doing uh, uh, looking at the, the context and the controls on a mineral deposit, uh, defining what types of structural features actually host the hydrothermal alteration, which is what Dick was allu alluding to as well. And, it, and, and recognizing too that features like joints are often very late. They may form a, an early structural permeability, but they can get sealed very quickly as hydrothermal alteration occurs. So we have a sequence of overprinting in uh, these structural environments uh, that, that we see whether it's for overprinting by the hydrothermal system itself, or like in Bruno's talk by uh, post-mineral deformation, which uh, affects these deposits. And you really have to sort that sequence out um, and mixing all structures together. And one of, the, one of the big problems too is not just mixing structures, um, which are formed at different times, but also mixing sets of data together. And this is happening more and more with the data driven approaches, taking bad data and mixing it good with good data sets. And we get just a, a real mass of, of uh, information, which really doesn't mean very much out of that in the end. So it's not just a case of training. It's a case of the wrong approach and not filtering the data that we have appropriately either. I think, think one thing I always tell people is, where's the gold? Start with the gold, work your way out. Look at what controls the gold, the alteration that's associated with gold. And work out from there, either in geological time, so in terms of deformation history, or in terms of in terms of the system itself. 
you know, if we, if we applied in terms of applied structural geology, where's the mineralization and, and go from there. And in deposits that are very strongly deformed, you know, work out what's obvious and then work back and forward in time. You know, start with the easy stuff first. Don't try to lump everything together and confuse the hell out of yourself. Yeah, I, I, I recall a conversation with Nick Oliver around this very thing, is that it's start where you can see what's happening and work into those areas of complexity. Um, mm. I've, I've got a, a good question come through in the chat uh, from Samuel Epstein, which is how has new technology changed field data collection? So that's, that's a question I'm, I'm going to put in there, and I want to add another flavour to that, which is... Um, as I can see a kicker coming in for day. Um, I want to add another question to that. So as well as how has new technology changed field data collection, what about the actual volume of data that we're collecting? Because you're touching on that a little bit as well. There's huge volumes of data often being collected now. And how do we, how are we actually handling that? And that might get into some of your thoughts, Tom, Wayne, and Paul. Yeah, I can comment. Um... It's certainly something uh, that is often getting overwhelming with the teams, but we, we have the technology is growing and developing this. Uh, the use of photogrammetry and LIDAR images is becoming fantastic. We can, we can map on Mars, we can map, you know, aspects of large open pits that we could never access. So the technology component is, is really helping also drive um, safer uh, data capture processes. Um, However, we are facing the, the opposite problem in that we can't access sometimes areas that we could in the past because of the safety protocols on the mines preventing us from accessing, accessing the rock up close. So the technology is a key uh, component of, of trying to overcome some of the, these challenges. But safety is very, very important. So the technology is a solution. Uh, we can, with drones, get up to very high resolution uh, to look at some of the uh, rock faces. Of course, we're going to miss the touching, licking the slick insides to figure out what's going on. And uh, that, that's a problem as well. Yeah, I'll jump in there as well, if you don't mind, Wayne. Um, for me, I think, I mean, the key thing that all this new data that we're getting is doing is it's taking out a lot of the subjectivity. Um, that's a key problem in a lot of models, especially when you're dealing with visual logging is that there's a lot of variability between individual geos uh, and a lot on reliability. So it has a positive in that um, it takes out that noise of, uh, of the geologist. And so the geologist then becomes more of a, he's applying context, he's applying significance. And that's, that's especially becomes a problem as you're, you get these huge data sets and complex data sets. It's, it's pairing that down to what's essential, domaining it, as Wayne talked about, to what's the essential observations. And to be honest, that's the same problem that a lot of early career geologists face when just visual logging a core. You know, I find a lot of young geologists will sort of sit there and they'll log things that they recognize. So they spend a lot of time collecting data and sort of things that they understand and recognize, but are not necessarily important. And then sort of, uh, as James alluded to, sort of, uh, avoid the really complex, difficult sort of bits that are in the middle where the gold is, um, but often domaining it effectively and just going, look, that's one big package of this, and I'm going to link that with the other one is, is, a, is a skill that you learn with experience, but it's, it's the, that's the key with um, these big data sets. Thanks, Paul. And, and Tom, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, <clears throat> here's one of uh, the important aspects of technology and our, uh, our subject, um, collecting structural data. Um, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what I can do with this nowadays, but there's also, of course, the other side to this, which we are confronting with young geologists day, daily in ever more acute ways in, in which, um, you know, the, the tendency is to go out in the field and run around and collect uh, collect lots of structural data, but that uh, is often done without understanding anything about the spatial relationships between one point and the next point. And not only that, there's also the very basic business of whether you have been looking at bedding or cleavage and, uh, you know, actually knowing, knowing what structure you have measured. So um, I'm sure like a lot of people who teach structural 
structural geology, we, we tend not to, or even in some cases, forbid the use of um, mobile phones in, in the early stages of mapping in order to avoid those pitfalls. Uh, so technology is definitely a two-edged sword and uh, training is, is absolutely key uh, there to being able to use them uh, technology effectively. Yeah, th thanks, Tom. And what about machine learning? Because, I mean, with these vast amounts of data, some people would say we can just put it all into some sort of machine learning algorithm and, and spit out an answer. Um, thoughts on that? <laughs> oh. Well, one comment in regard to that is that, I, and I've heard on multiple occasions, is that uh, in, in machine learning approaches, often people take this approach that um, one should not bias the data and therefore use all the data, which is actually a form of data bias, because you're assuming then all the data is equally weighted. So by filtering the data, of course, by the appropriate types of structures that apply to what your objective is, becomes, uh, of course, isolating the, the types of structures and the, and the better quality data through QAQC or through proactive approach of data acquisition becomes a, a potentially an effective way of using those types of data-driven approaches if it's properly quantified and qualified as to what all that data is rather than utilizing it all together. And one example I always like to use is that you can have an area of uh, 100 kilometers where there's two outcrops. It just happens that there's faults spaced every 10 meters in the whole area that have nothing to do with mineralization. Both of them, both of those two outcrops capture those faults, but they have nothing to do with the ore. So, but if you did a purely a, a prospectivity approach or a data-driven approach on this, you would find a link between those faults and the mineralization, even though they have nothing to do with it. But by going on the outcrops and filtering those out, you can actually then start to look at the features that actually do control the mineralization through that filtering process. I, I can give you two examples where uh, the augmentation or addition of machine learning to the structure analysis has actually worked really well. Well, one is in VMS deposits. Uh, when we look at VMS deposits, obviously we have a certain distribution of the different sulfide species within a deposit. And there are really good machine learning techniques to take the different, uh, different aspects of the assay data and actually look at the different spatial 3D distribution of the different mineral, uh, mineral styles of mineralization in three dimensions. That's really useful to look to see what the architecture of the mineral system actually is and versus a very deformed deposit where you might have intercalations of polymetallic mineralization, copper mineralization. And it's super fast now, with, uh, with, uh, particularly with some of the you know, geochemical software. The other one that's been really useful, and this really has to come with, with some really good uh, uh, structural core logging, is when we can use different uh, machine learning uh, photo recognition techniques to actually draw out different styles of veins within, say, say an orogenic gold deposit. If they have a particular color or a particular characteristic, it can actually do a lot of automated logging uh, that is not really possible uh, by, by a geologist hands-on. And that can be really useful when tied to the assay data and to have a look in three dimensions, but it has to be tied with an understanding of, of which vein systems are actually auriferous and, and discriminating out the different, obviously we've got tons and tons of vein systems often in a vein hosted deposit, which ones are barren, which ones are late, and you need to have that color contrast or some contrast in the core to do it. But those, those techniques can be, can be very useful uh, when, when applied and when, when used discriminately. Thanks, James. I'm just gonna alert a few of you to some key questions that you might like to pick up on in a moment. Um, Wayne and Paul, there's one there from Brooke Lisson that's coming down in the Q&A. If you can pick up on that in a couple of minutes. And Ajit's got a really good question in here that really speaks to that confidence of what happens when you go into the field. And I wonder whether um, Dick and Stephen, you can have a look at that one by Ajit. And there's um, a question there uh, really directed towards you, Dave, a wee bit from David Thomas. And I, I wonder whether you could have a look, little bit of a look at those. And we'll come into uh, Wayne and Paul on Brooke's question now, which is, can you please speak briefly to preliminary workflows for processing both oriented core and historic drift structure mapping in order to increase quality and confidence and how those two data sets should be treated differently? And that quality and confidence has been coming through in quite a few of the comments at the moment. 
I didn't catch all of that, uh, Judy. Um, the, 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 the key, piece. yeah. It's the last I, one. I line. think I got, the, I got the gist of it. I, the, the key here is, um, was really on the confidence of the data and particularly in core. Um, this is why we, we developed a, a table um, that lookup table example. It's a, it's a very standard, simple process of, of describing uh, whether the, the confidence of a fault, right? It's based fundamentally on textures that we, that we would generally regard as high or low confidence. So if you see pressure and gouge, you've got a high confidence that that's a fault. Um, and as, so as you go through that table, you'll see that there's a couple of categories there where we've got lower confidence that this is a representative fault. So it's just guidelines for those young geologists who's, who's not, you know, where we see on so many projects, they're just not sure. Sometimes they will look at something and just ignore it. And uh, in other cases, they will try to log everything and it becomes a data overload, which is just not good data. So that's, that's, part, of the, that's part of the solution we're presenting on the core logging side. Um, I think we also mustn't forget that uh, there's having peer review, having that, and we started this, this debate earlier on this topic, having um, uh, experienced person on site providing oversight and, you know, uh, and, um, and guidance is, is, is very important. Um, most projects we go to, we don't have a technical expert who can actually guide the young geologists in that process. Um, which is why in our paper we still strongly recommend the training processes too for, for, for structural geology and core logging and getting these youngsters trained up. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, and uh, we, the problem right now is we just don't seem to have enough structural geologists in the industry uh, qualified enough to, to manage these programs at a high technical level. We can come back to that yeah. point. A moment. Uh, Paul, over to you. What do you think? Yeah, I think, I mean, the first thing I would say is that the, usually the historic drift structure mapping is obviously the confidence levels associated with the individual measurements is usually better. Um, there's a lot more that can go wrong in the core orientation process. So with the core orientation data, you want to have a look at the data, particularly if you have a relatively continuous or consistent uh, feature like bedding or foliation and just look for small circle distributions on a stereo net that tell you whether the, or give you a clue as to whether the actual orientation process has been done correctly. Um, and with the historic drift data and actually both data, um, often you, and I think Wayne touched on this, often the, the big problem is figuring out people tend to collect a lot of data and not a lot of it is not very useful. Um, and it's trying to figure out what's significant and what's not. Um, so when I personally log, I usually apply a significance rating to each measurement like and that tells me how I'm going to use it um, is this a vein which I'm interested in understanding the orientation of the vein networks or right, I'm probably only going to use that in stereo net or is this a major fault which I think probably controls the overall envelope of mineralization that's a high significant structure so that's going to go into my 3d model potentially um, so yeah checking for data quality and data quality by the way, might actually require just pulling out the core again and having a look, particularly if you see sharp changes in, say, again, a continuous or consistent uh, feature like bedding or foliation. Go back and look at those sharp changes. Do you actually see a fold or anything there that could explain that, or is it just a problem with your orientation line? Thanks very much, Paul. I'm going to jump across to um, Stephen and Dick, and also perhaps Bruno, on, on looking at this um, question here that is uh, asking about types of field data you might uh, begin collecting and analyzing first in a polyphase deformed setting where there have been potentially been overprinting mineralizing events but the relative timing of deformation is understood and, and I guess this is one of those questions that really um, speaks to confidence of what to do when you're confronted with field geology. I'll, I'll jump in there first JR. Um, yeah, confidence is the important thing. I, when I go and visit mine sites, I find that the major issue is loss of confidence. Um, people may have learned some things when they're at uni, but that now seems like years ago and they just lost the ability to do it. So I guess my experience is mainly in low grade metamorphic environments um, to medium grade metamorphic environments. If I come across an outcrop, the first thing I tend to do is say, okay, can I find bedding? Can I find some sort of lithological layering? If I can, I think about 
where does that sit in stratigraphy? So to me, growth stratigraphy or intrusive relationships are very important. I look for things like cleavage or foliation. Uh, I look at bedding cleavage vergence, for example. Uh, which way do I go to find the next antiform or synform? All those sorts of things are really important. What's the yanging direction in sequence? Can I find evidence for yanging from mesoscopic structures like graded bedding or from macroscopic things like the sequence of stratigraphy that we might know from regional mapping? They're really important things. When I go into a shear zone or fault environment, always looking for veins and using vein fault or vein shear zone relationships to get the shear sense. And then I start asking questions like, what's the mineralogy of this fault zone? What's the hydrothermal alteration style? Is it the same as the mineralization we're after? A whole range of things. And then the question relates to polyphase deformation. Of course, we're always looking for overprinting relationships. What's folding what? What is cutting what? And they're not always clear cut relationships, particularly in vein systems. So, to me, overprinting relationships, real hard, solid evidence is what's needed. But work from the first question to me is where am I? <laughs> Do I know where I am? Then, where am I in stratigraphy? What's, what's the bedding orientation? What's the yanging? Those sorts of things. And build the story up to see the sequence for things. Then, the final question is when you're trying to put it together is, which structures are active during mineralization? Which structures can be activated by the stress regime during mineralization? And trying to map those sorts of relationships. Not easy, needs lots of field work. Thanks, David. Dick, what do you think? Well, in the porphyry world, very few of them actually get deformed, although people keep looking for them in Scandinavia, apparently in the Paleoproterozoic. The oldest one we know is, is Grenvillian down there in Zambia, but there's a, there's a few that are supposed to be porphyries up in Scandinavia. Maybe even Bruno knows one in, in the Superior Province. There's, there's a couple that were being sold. But, but in porphyries, veins are king. And veins, you, you, when you come up to a porphyry, you're looking for the vein, the vein density, that is how many veins per meter. You can calculate a volume. You map that out along with whatever the hydrothermal alteration is, both what you see and what you can see in the rocks, because in porphyries, the low temperature alteration basically pseudomorphs the high temperature. The textures are preserved. So you're mapping rock types, any sort of intrusive contacts, you're looking for the looking for the early porphyries because they've seen all the fluid and tend to be higher grade. You map out vein density and you can contour that. And, and actually vein density always increases towards the core. And you're mapping the hydrothermal alteration. If you're like kilometers out from a porphyry, then you're finding the, the lateral permeability fabric, which we know can go just a few hundred meters, depending upon where you are in the crustal column, to five kilometers. So you, get on, and you only have two choices, really, because you're not going to, it's not up. So it's, you used your hydrothermal geochemistry and built your gradients along those, those per permeability pathways. So it's, you've got to look at the rocks, the hydrothermal alteration, the geochemistry, and the vein geometry. Thanks, Dick. And I'm going to come across to Bruno, and then I'm going to flag um, Tom and Dave. I'm, I'm going to ask you in a, in a minute just uh, what your approach is when you go and you're confronted by an outcrop and, and, and how, you, um, how you maintain your confidence when you're out in the field. Um, Bruno, in, in response to that previous question. Yeah, uh, I would say like mapping in volcanic rock or, or VMS camp, I would, my advice would be to start mapping if there is sedimentary rock, interleaf sedimentary rock, cover sedimentary rock. And the reason is because in volcanic rock, they don't have the micas that sedimentary rocks have that where you can create good fabric. You typically don't have the uh, good bedding surfaces. Uh, you can get sometimes strike, dip is more difficult. So getting structures developed within volcanic rock is more difficult. It, it's more difficult than within sedimentary rock. So if you can, if you can uh, 
I get a sequence of deformation event of structures within established a sequence of deformation event and structure within sedimentary rock and build your confidence by knowing how the sedimentary rocks have recorded deformation, then you can apply that to the, the volcanic rock. You have to be careful though, because if the sedimentary rocks are cover sequence, it might be deformation event within the volcanic rocks that are not recorded within the sediment, sedimentary rock. And one mapping shear zones with veins, my, my, my big advice would be don't assume that the veins are coming in during shearing. It's very, the, the shear zone can be easily superposed on a pre existing system. Thanks very much, Bruno. Really helpful comments here. And I can, so we're going to come into a question for Dave and, and Tom around just how you maintain your confidence when you're out into the field and looking at something fresh. Um, and, and also perhaps touching on Stephen's uh, a question for Stephen in here, which is how do you actually recognize whether a structure was active during mineralization? Um, so just those confidence questions first, maybe starting with you, Tom. Okay. Um, it's not perhaps all that fashionable these days, but um, a very big thing for me is to have a clear uh, story at the end of the day of D1, D2, D3, D4, etc. I mean, I have heard people casting doubt on this as uh, an old fashioned approach uh, and one that's not in fact necessary, but actually for me, it really is important. And that goes to the extent that if you have to insert a D between D3 and D4, then you have to do it. <laughs> and you have to expand your deformation sequence to however many numbers it is necessary to do so. At the same time, one has to recognize, of course, that many of those events may have a very local expression um, and, um, and, and therefore may not be recognizable. But in the end, having that clear table of deformation events and hopefully also sort of um, kinematic and even a dynamic interpretation of them, I think is what I aim for to help me develop confidence so that I can say, well, this particular structure probably started off at least in D2 and may have been reactivated in D3. The other point I, I think um, about uh, how difficult it is, which, which Steve men Stephen mentioned and um, also comes up with this issue about cross-cutting relationships. Uh, I, I would like to turn that around perhaps as a, as a question to which I have an answer myself, but I'd like to know what the rest of the panel thinks. And that is the use of microstructures and thin sections to work out some of the finer detail. Again, that's a, a controversial one, and it would be particularly interesting to hear from an industry point of view, um, whether in fact making a, a thin section is, is something that people have time for these days or see any value in. So perhaps I can pose that as a, as a question um, and see what people think. Great question. Maybe, Dave, you can partly pick up on that and, and maybe um, anyone really. Yeah, thanks, JR. And, and I fully uh, um, uh, agree with everything that Tom just said. Um, one of the things that you see when you are trying to establish a deformation history is that, particularly in metamorphic belts, uh, typically a deformation sequence will be retrograde because the earliest events tend to be the most high temperature and most intense and tend to overprint earlier events. So in, in alluding back to Tom's comment about thin sections, sometimes in folded iron formations, for example, in Northern Canada, where we can see they're multiply folded many times, sometimes the first fabrics you can only see in porphyroblasts that have overgrown those fabrics and everything else is recrystallized, so you've lost it all. So typically what you'll see is in a metamorphic environment, an orogenic gold setting, for example, is that uh, the, we, we start off with ductile fabrics and we end off with brittle fabrics as things cool or later events occur. So clay gouges often have nothing to do with the mineralization. So understanding that the PT conditions that the different events occur at tells you a lot about to the sequence. And thus, so the cross-cutting relationships are essential, but also too, a clay gouge is not gonna form this at the same time as a ductile shear zone. So these are very different kinds of structures that you need to sort out. And another really important aspect is, of course, is that lithology is structure. The rheology, the, the porosity, the permeability of the whole rock mass 
influences how those structures form, where they form, where they're the most intense. Um, and, and so understanding, uh, having a very good understanding of, of the geology is essential in understanding the structure. Where are your structures going to form? When did they form? Are they truncated by certain intrusions or events? So these are all uh, important aspects that you can't just do structure in isolation. You have to look at everything. So, you know, one of the one of the aspects, you know, when I reach a mine site or, or a project is I want to know everything. I want to know everything from uh, the, the, the lithological sequence, how is it superimposed, what are the fault offsets of stratigraphic units, um, to what's their rheological behavior, what are altered, what aren't, and, and the, as, as far as sorting out mineralized structures from under-mineralized ones, then it's obviously the ones that, can, that, that transmit the hydrothermal fluid that are the ones that really are controlling uh, the mineralization. And in a lot of environments, it's hard to determine that, particularly if you have oxidation. So if I'm in a place like in Africa where there's deep oxidation, you wanna pull out drill core from the freshest rocks to be able to see what that structure looks like before it's been affected by supergene alteration. So you can actually see, ah, there's a ductile fabric here. That's where all the pyrite is. And this goes back again to Tom's comment is that, is petrography useful? Well, someone beside me will say that it is because she does petrography all the time, but, but essentially we do petrography all the time. We're doing um, structural work because we need to sort those things out. Like when did the gold come in? If you're looking at uh, a, a vein system, for example, is the gold particulate in pyrite? Is it come in later on, on later veinlets and so forth? And the petrography is essential in sorting that out too. So it's a real spectrum of things you can look at at different scales, I would say. Thank you, Mike. That's common error, Dave, which is use everything. Whatever you need to get to the answer, use it. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other comments people would like to put in? We've got about 10 minutes left, and I just wondered whether you had any questions or any insights you'd like to give to the 259 people still listening. Well done, you guys. Feel free to chip in and offer any words of wisdom. I'll chime in, Julie. Questions. Great, go for it. Uh, well, I just... Um... Two things, yeah, petrology, absolutely, and petrographic descriptions, absolutely. Um, we, you, I try to use that quite a lot, um, but I don't have those skills anymore. So that uh, tends to be outsourced, um, Tom. And I think you'll find that's pretty standard through a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the industry. Um, in terms of what to do at an outcrop, um, I would just say for, for those who are sort of early career, my two bits of advice would be one, take your time, don't feel in a rush, particularly in those first couple of days. Everything looks confusing, everything's slightly overwhelming. Just don't be in a hurry. Don't sit there and go, well, I have to cover this much ground. It'll come later once you get your head around the sort of geology. Uh, the second thing I'd say, since this, uh, the volume was dedicated to Rick Simpson, is some of the best advice I had was um, very early on from Rick was move. You know, when you first get to an outcrop, you stand back. Then you get right up close, you get on your knees, you move back, and you keep moving around that outcrop, looking at different scales until you broadly understand the overall outcrop, what you think the key features are, and then go in, measure it, describe it. Um, don't just run at the outcrop and throw your compass on every single feature you can see. Paul, any other comments? Dick. Yeah, I, I got one. I mean, I, I work with a lot of junior companies, particularly down in, in South America and whatnot, and with a lot of, and, and one of the things that is, I find really helpful because they're collecting a lot of data, but they never actually plot a section with the drill hole mm -hmm. and put on rocks, alteration, mineralization, three sections. And, and build build a section across there. I mean, this applies also to Canada. Not that it's third world day, but uh, it, it, it really actually is one of the best learning experiences for a young geologist to actually use a pencil and a paper. It, it, it forces them to make a decision and, and it forces them to put it down and I tell them to use a pencil because erasers work. You know, <laughs> if you have a good eraser, you can, if you change your mind, you can erase it. Now, in a, in, in, in a data rich environment, like some of the stuff Paul and Wayne and James deal with, that's, of course, much more difficult 
to do. But in a in an initial stage, when you get a young geo, give them a, give them a drill hole, hole and say, give me a section down here with rocks, veins, whatever three sections, and that's their training. It, it works amazingly well. To, to you know, going back to pencils. Thanks, Dick James. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think when you hear some of the comments, there's one thing that's very key, both what Dick just said, but both what we were talking about in terms of field mapping as well. And that is the skill of interpretation is really important. You know, the, the collection of data for data's sake does not work. And you have to be thinking when you're on the outcrop, you have to be thinking when you're looking at the draw core and thinking what the importance is, how this relates to the next section over or the next outcrop over. And you know, often people get trapped in this either informational overload or not being understand, not being able to understand the outcrop that they're on. And what I always tell people is, yeah, always interpret, always be interpreting, always be thinking about what it means. But if you don't have the answer, move on. If it doesn't make sense, move on. Okay, but keep, always keep interpreting. And I think that's the key skill that people have to remember in the field and, and uh, that is the foundation of, of, of structural analysis to me, is if you don't interpret whilst you're actually mapping, whilst you're actually logging, then, then you're losing a huge amount of information. Thanks, James. Really wise words. And we're just going to round out now because we're coming up to the end, perhaps with final comments from uh, Tom and Stephen, Bruno, Wayne and Dave. Uh, just to, just to follow up on what James uh, said there too is that I think one of the key pro approaches here is it always has to be a proactive structural uh, data gathering approach. You really need to define your your history and your understanding to really put everything into context. And gathering data and utilizing it as you gather it is essential because it, it not only shows you the quality of the data but the usefulness of the different types of features. And that includes putting things on cross sections, just as Dick was saying too. Interpret as you go. Utilize the data that way you're going to be able to filter out the the, the material that's not useful from the, the what is thanks very much Stephen um, I'll address the question you raised just a few minutes ago JR that was the one of how do I recognize whether something was active during mineralization to me the key thing there is looking at the overprinting relationships and the sequence of events so we had a, a shear zone we we're playing with Western Australia the first thing we saw in the shear zone was foliation production, very intense foliation in the shear zone, which was related to potassic alteration. Then we saw overprinting by albite quartz carbonate with very high grade gold. They were then overprinted by a series of quartz rich veins and then quartz calcite veins and then quartz, um, quartz biotite veins. So we saw these really nice overprinting relationships and mutually overprinting relationships. So we see veins which are formed have been deformed and now printed by less deformed veins. So we've got this ongoing sequence of deformation. It's not an instant. So to form an order in a size unit regime, we're needing hundreds of thousands, if not tens of millions of slip events. There's a lot of sequencing in there. Thanks, Stephen. Tom. Yeah, I think a, a really nice example of, of that uh, important point about interpreting while you're going along is how terrible a practice it is, which you see quite often of um, core logging, just being a collection of alpha and beta angles um, throughout the whole day and never being uh, plotted up as in a geographical frame of reference to actually understand what those those angles mean. That, that has to be done at the same time so that you can have any idea of what you're really looking at. So yes, I really support that idea. And of course, uh, the other thing about that is that process is that as you make your interpretation you're 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 constantly testing the previous interpretation it's a it's an iterative process of reinterpreting and re refining what you think you know towards something that you can have uh, increasing com confidence in thanks tom and uh, bruno then when yeah i, I mean my comment is the same as everybody. It's just when you're mapping, you should be, you should be building a map as you're mapping. You should be building a map with ontology structures, alteration as you're mapping. 
you shouldn't just put the data within your notebook or within the tablet and then do a map. I remember one time a student did that and it ended up that all his outcrop on his map were rectangular because he was taking the corners of every outcrop. And that, that shows that, that, that he didn't put anything on the map and obviously he wasn't able to interpret this area. Thanks, Bruno. Last, last comment, Wayne, before we round out. Might be a similar theme, but I've been to a lot of mines around the world and there's so commonly the same problem. We've got a lot of junior geologists straight out of university collecting data. They just collect data, collect data, whether it's for exploration purposes or for uh, geotechnical purposes. And it's just data. They never get to see the big picture of what they're trying to do with their data. They don't get involved in that overall interpretation process to know why they're doing it. Uh, they get bored and frustrated and leave <laughs> the industry. Uh, it, it's a, to me, it's a problem. They, whoever's involved in data collection needs to understand very clearly what we're trying to achieve. Well, look, we're, we're coming to the end and I, um, I just want to, I guess, I finish off with that um, synthesis of ideas, really. And that I recall uh, often students would say to me, structures really, well, I won't say it to me, of course, because I teach it so well, but they'd say, structure's a hard subject. And, and you find people have this, this idea that it's a, it has this reputation. And yet, I think one of the aims of this volume was to try and package things up so that there's something in this volume that's of use to anyone going out into working with or forming hydrothermal systems. Because um, I think what we've heard here are some really simple ideas that would, could give people confidence to, to improve their application of structural geology in these systems. And, and the key thing I'm hearing in these last comments is always maintaining that thinking around what does it mean? What is the relevance of the data I'm collecting? How does it fit? How does it, how does it match to the next place I might walk? So always having that meaning in mind. Um, I'd like to just thank everyone here today, all our panelists for a really excellent discussion and for putting the effort into uh, making our webinars, which are gonna be available uh, um, afterwards in about a week, I think they're going up on the SCG website. And also just to reiterate that that structural volume, I know I'm biased, but I think it's an excellent, excellent one to have on the shelf and an excellent one to have in your operation if you've got a little company going. And I think, Dan, have you got that? Um, are you going to flash up that code again or put it up so people can see it in case they want to get a, a little uh, a discount on that book? Um, there it is there. There is the discount code. It is active for 72 hours. So if that's what, if, if you'd like a copy, get in there. I, I think it's really good value. Um, I know we haven't covered off quite all the questions, but I think we've certainly covered a lot and uh, really encourage you to read that book. And once again, um, thank you very much. And if anyone's still online, and we've got 232 people up there, if you want to put in a little vote of appreciation through one of those cool things you can do on Zoom and let these panellists know that they've done a fantastic job, that'd be great. And then we're going to sign off. So thank you all. Thanks, JR. Great thank seminar, you. everybody. Thank you. Thanks, JR. Yeah, thanks, thanks, JR. Thanks, 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 Dave. Thanks all to all of our panellists. Um, it's been a great yeah, discussion. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to go through a few details before um, we conclude today. So the discount code, as JR mentioned, is up here. I'll leave it on for just a few more seconds so you can all write it down and um, keep track of it. And it's on the SEG store. And then I want to, I cannot let everyone go without doing a slight plug for our conference coming up. The SEG 2022 conference is going to be August 27th through the 30th here in Denver. So it'll be a great opportunity to come and um, meet. We are holding virtual and in-person um, offerings. The virtual registration is currently open. The in-person registration will open next week. So stay tuned if you're looking to, to come here to Denver itself. We will have um, several, the in-person workshops are currently up there, but we will have several, um, the virtual workshops, the in-person workshops, and we'll have some field trips as well during the conference. A few upcoming events uh, that we are hosting, the, ex the second installment of SEG's Exploration and Technology Series 
will be on July 14th. It's focusing on machine learning and big data. Um, so join our distinguished panelists as we explore the evolving roles on these technologies and exploration and answer questions from the audience. This event is specifically focused for students and early career professionals and it's sponsored by MapTech. And as a reminder to any eligible uh, SEG student members or SEG recent graduates, we have a, a mapping course that we are offering. It's the Michael J. Fitzgerald student mapping course. The deadline for this is uh, June 6th, I believe. Um, yep, June 6th. So please get your applications in for that. And this is a more advanced mapping course. So for all of you who now are sold on needing more mapping skills, this is the course to sign up for. And then just another huge thanks to everyone, our panelists for um, presenting today and also for contributing to the volume originally. Uh, please, for all of our attendees, uh, thanks for Thanks for sticking with us for this long. And if you can, when you sign off, please take the survey that will pop up. We really appreciate you and we have a special appreciation to all of our members. Thanks everyone. <laughs>